three minutes after nine o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this morning. Nice looking, beautiful looking Monday morning. Uh, I don't know what the weather is like on the other side of the world, but we have somebody on the phone who's on the other side of the world down in Australia. Professor George uh, Jelinek is on the phone. And of course, he's not calling in to give us a weather report. Listen to this. He was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. He is the first professor of emergency medicine in Australia. He's an honorary professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Prevention Medicine at uh, Monash University in Australia. He's a medical clinician, a researcher, the editor of the medical journal Emergency Medicine Australia. Australasia, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, and he's written a couple of outstanding books that you want to pay attention to, especially if you are dealing with multiple sclerosis or know somebody who is. Uh, one of the books is called Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis, an evidence-based guide to recovery. And the other one is Recovering from Multiple Sclerosis, Real Life Stories of Hope and Inspiration. And that's what this interview is going to definitely give you is hope and inspiration. Professor George Jelinek, good morning. Thank you so much for being on the air with us today. Morning, Larry. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you. How, first of all, how am I doing with your name? Yeah, Jelinek's good. You've got that pretty well. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, and what's the weather like in Australia? I have to ask. <laughs> uh, it's about eleven. To, a bit after eleven at night, and it's a bit cold and bleak here. So um, we're heading into a winter, and it looks like it's already started. Isn't that something? It's just always hard for us to imagine that. But anyway, thank you for being on the air. So how are you doing? How is your multiple sclerosis? Uh, look, I'm doing really well, thanks. Um, it's been 15 years since I was diagnosed, and um, I've been following the principles that I've put out in the book all that time, and uh, I remain perfectly well. I'm actually just turned 60 recently, and I'm fitter and healthier than I've ever been in my life, really. And, and do you, it, can we consider that multiple sclerosis is curable or stoppable or, or something else? Look, I think um, cure isn't a word I ever use. I certainly talk about recovery, though, and it's possible for people to regain very considerable function provided they eliminate some of the risk factors uh, for this disease progressing. And that's a lot of the research that we've been doing in the last uh, year or two, looking at which risk factors are responsible for this disease getting worse and there's quite a few of them that we can actually do something about. And, and we definitely want to hear what they are but I'm, I'm just curious before we start identifying them are they the cause also of multiple if they're risk factors for making it get worse do they bring it on in the first place? Uh, I think it's generally accepted they do but mm. you need to have a genetic susceptibility to it in the first place because it very much runs in families. My mother had it for example and uh, she died after about 13 years with the disease, and she was quite disabled at the end. So, oh wow, uh, oh wow, it's certainly a strong family um, tendency. So the first, the first fear anytime somebody gets a diagnosis is that they're going to be uh, inca incapable of, of so many things. They're going to be stuck in a wheelchair, for example, is one of the fears, right? Yeah, it was certainly my first uh, fear when I was diagnosed. It, it's a long time ago now, 15 years, but I, I can remember those first few months uh, very vividly and particularly seeing my mother deteriorate so dramatically. I thought that uh, really that was very likely to be my fate as well, so I'm very grateful that things have turned out the way they have. Is the information in the book, especially the one called Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis, is the information being challenged by mainstream medicine? No, I think the interesting thing is gradually parts of the book, um, which seemed perhaps a little bit radical when I first put them down on paper 15 years ago, have started to be accepted by the profession, and uh, most particularly, I think, the, the role of vitamin D, which I, I know we hear a lot about in a variety of diseases, but it seems to have a very particular place in uh, MS, both in uh, the disease coming on in first developing the disease, people with a low vitamin D level who don't get much sun exposure very typically are prone to MS, but also um, the way the disease progresses if your vitamin D level is attended to and lifted up with some vitamin D supplements or getting out in the sun, you can significantly slow the progression of this disease. You had undertaken a huge, huge study that we were informed was called the Holism Study, where you studied over 2,500 people with MS from 57 countries. Uh, how did you decide that this was your mission to embark on this to help others? Well, I guess as far as the research goes, the thing I realized, I put a lot of these findings down in the book that Larry referred to, Overcoming MS, and I sort of realized after a while that it, was, it wasn't 
really much use me just quoting other people's research. If I was really going to change the way things were done in mainstream medicine, I had to do some research myself. And so um, luckily I'm in a situation where I can do research. I know how to do it. I've looked at a lot of research over my career. And so I was able to get some philanthropic funding to uh, assemble this very large database of people from all over the world. And we looked at all the factors around the lifestyle that they were leading and how disabled they were and whether they were getting relapses, what their quality of life was like. And, and we were really uh, heartened to see that the things I put in the book were largely proven in this study. That is that people who had a diet that was very heavy in saturated fat had very significantly more disability. That's animal fat. So people who ate a lot of meat and not much fruit and vegetables had unhealthy fats were getting much sicker, had much poorer quality of life. And that also held up for... Um, for omega-3 supplements, if you were taking omega-3 supplements, you had dramatically fewer relapses and you were much less disabled. So it, it really showed that a number of the things that we were saying were true were, were very likely. And in this big sample of people, they were true. And it sounds so familiar. It sounds like s things we've heard from other um, authors, for example, uh, we even have a guest coming on later on this morning who lost a lot of weight, and he'll, he'll he, in his book, he's almost saying, well, not exactly the same things you're saying, obviously, but, but it's almost like there's a there's good food and there's bad food, and if we just stuck with the good food, we'd not only perhaps be healthier with in regards to multiple sclerosis, but so many other things. Well, it's really interesting, actually, and it's part of why um, I think we have to change the way we look at MS. I mean, MS has been seen as this kind of incurable mystery neurological disease, but in yeah. fact, it's one of the common Western, well, relatively common, not as common as heart disease, obviously, and type 2 diabetes, but becoming more common. It's the commonest neurological dis uh, disease in young people, but it has very much in common with those chronic Western diseases. And in fact, when you look at the risk factors in MS for its progression, they're pretty much identical to those for heart disease and type 2 diabetes. You know, it's, it's poor diet, as you say, Larry. It's a lack of exercise, smoking, not getting enough uh, sunshine outdoors, not having omega-3s in your diet, uh, low vitamin D level. It really is a, a very common story. And we could actually all do well to embrace this kind of way of living. We're all going to be healthier and avoid some of those chronic Western diseases if we live this way. So do you think this is uh, genetic because of the way people live? Um, certainly there's a genetic component in MS. It's, it's well known that you need uh, to have that sort of genetic predisposition to get the disease. But actually the things that... Uh, influence the way the disease progresses once you have it are largely environmental. They're, they're largely those risk factors I mentioned around diet and exercise and sun exposure and so on. Now, one of the things you mentioned in overcoming multiple sclerosis is steroids. And um, you actually say there's a, there's a positive reason to use steroids. Explain that. Well, there's uh, steroids as in not like the anabolic steroids that, that sort of muscle um, builders use, but the steroids we use in medicine that uh, help dampen down inflammation, they're actually quite a helpful um, pharmaceutical to use when you're having an acute relapse. But of course, the, the approach I adopt in the book and in the way um, we, we teach people to live this way is that if you can live this way and reduce those risk factors, with every, um, there's every chance you'll never need steroids. You'll actually reduce your relapses so dramatically that... Uh, oh, really? ...and won't need the steroids. Does, is, is somebody who is recently diagnosed with multiple sclerosis apt or likely to um, ward off any of the, of the symptoms associated with MS by, by, by changing their uh, lifestyle? That's what uh, we've put down in our second book, um, Larry, that you mentioned um, recovering from multiple sclerosis. And one of the things that I wanted to do was sort of take the focus off myself a little bit. Obviously, you know, I've been saying that I've been well for 15 years, but yeah, yeah. it was important to show that actually other people following this approach were also staying well. And so in that book, we've told the stories of 12 people. Um, three of them are actually doctors who've adopted this uh, lifestyle approach and their relapses have gone away. Their disability has turned around. A number of them are now completely symptom-free um, after a diagnosis of MS. Wow. And, um, you know, that's what we all hope is going to happen uh, if we can be really rigorous about living this way. Right. Uh, I, want, I just want to be sure that we understand, is it, is it reversing or just stopping? In other words, if somebody's in a wheelchair, are they, is there any hope for them by changing the lifestyle? 
Yeah, there's certainly hope for them, and I think the thing that's important to do first is get some control and some stability over this disease, because if you do nothing, then there's progressive deterioration. We know that from all the studies, but the important thing is to get some control over that through a healthy diet, more exercise, and all the things we've been talking about, so that the disease process is under control, so that the inflammation is controlled. And when you do that, the nervous system has an amazing capacity to regenerate itself, to remyelinate those nerve cells that have been stripped of their myelin by the disease process. And so people find, if they adopt this kind of lifestyle approach, that if once they get some stability over the disease, which can take couple of years, maybe two to three years, um, people find with time, they start recovering some of that lost function. Now, how much of that you get back is really, um, it depends a lot on how far progressed you were. Um, we've got one of the ladies in the book, uh, Rebecca Hoover, who's a Minnesotan, um, tells us that she was actually very disabled, very nearly in a wheelchair. She's now running intervals and she's 63 years old. Wow. 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 And, wow. And, and the blurred vision that sometimes associ is associated with MS, does that reverse itself also? Uh, look, there's a lot of these symptoms and signs that can improve. Mm. Um, the degree of recovery that you get is very individual and varies from person to person. Of course, you know, we don't want to say that this is a panacea um, for everybody. Yeah. Everyone's MS is, um, is individual. But when you look at that very large sample of people that we looked at, 2,500 to 3,000, the, um, the overwhelming picture you get from that is that people who live this way are dramatically better than those who don't, both in quality of life and in disability. Is MS readily di diagnosed by a doctor, or could it be... Uh a misdiagnosed as something else? These days it's fairly uh, fairly reliable, the diagnosis, since the advent of MRI scanning. I think um, that was a really big step forward in the MRI diagnosis. In the old days, certainly around the time my mother had it, it was very hit and miss, very much a clinical judgment sort of by looking at the person examining them. But now with MRI, we can get a fairly accurate picture of what's going on in the brain and spinal cord. And so it's pretty unusual to make a, a wrong diagnosis. There are a few other conditions that can be similar, but usually there's not much diagnostic confusion. Professor George Jelinek is on the phone with us. He's calling in from Australia where it's 11 o'clock at night and the winter is beginning, yeah. <laughs> which is hard to believe. Uh, and, and he's got some important books, especially if you know somebody or are somebody with multiple sclerosis. One book is called Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis. The other one is Recovering from Multiple Sclerosis. The Recovering book uh, has some stories of, of people who've used the, the uh, techniques described in the first book um, to drastically change their lives for the better. Did they find you and, and begin the therapy that you recommended or were they already doing it and you found them? Now what we have been doing um, now for about the last uh, 11 or 12 years is running live-in retreats for people with MS uh, in Australia and now in the UK and Europe as well. So we run um, week-long live-in retreats where people with MS come and stay for the week and we show them uh, all of the evidence behind this approach. We, um, the food we provide is in line with the, the um, plant-based whole food diet that we're recommending. Um, we teach them how to meditate to reduce their stress and so on. And so uh, quite a number of these people in the book were people who'd been to the retreats and one of the things that we notice is if you come to one of these retreats people tend to really embrace this whole lifestyle because they can see when you've had a week of constant exposure to it just how uh, how convincing it is when you look at all the evidence. Um, so most of those people uh, had been through retreats but a number of them actually I just came across looking through various Facebook groups and uh, people who were obviously doing well and uh, had adopted this approach and mm. one of them as I mentioned Rebecca Hoover from Minnesota she's got her own website called the intelligent person's guide to beating MS and she talks all about exactly the same things that we talk about and I was quite uh, surprised to find her out there blogging away about the same stuff isn't that interesting so is are we yeah. talking about like a vegan diet I mean as far as the diet part of this is concerned is it vegan or vegetarian it's essentially vegan, so there's no meat and no dairy, but we also have seafood uh, in it as well for the omega-3 um, okay. fatty acid content. So it's a relatively easy um, diet and a very um, enjoyable diet. You've got all the, the plant-based foods 
that comprise a vegan diet plus all the various different types of seafood. So uh, um, it's actually a real, really optimally healthy diet and it's uh, incredibly enjoyable and, and you can do some great things with it. Uh, since you said that uh, this uh, is diagnosed through MRI scans and uh, things to do with the brain, do people with dementia, are they exempt from getting MS because their brain is going off in a different direction than other people? Well, um, sadly, no one's really exempt from getting MS. And people with all sorts of other diseases, cardiovascular disease, strokes, they can all get uh, MS if they've got that genetic predisposition and then all uh, the stars kind of line up, then you can get both diseases, um, which can be um, really very difficult. Have you, have you do, can you tell us a story of somebody who maybe, and maybe some are typical and some are not typical, but the, the five-day retreats kind of fascinates me. Do, do you have some stories of people who, I mean, just five days into the new lifestyle that they were learning at the retreat that they actually saw improvement already? It is one of the interesting things, um, Larry. We, we do notice that some of the people um, see such a dramatic change that they're already feeling uh, noticeably better by the end of the five days just with the meditation and the new diet uh, and being completely out of all the stress that they're normally in. The stress plays a, a very significant role in the progression and in the, the relapses in this disease. Oh, really? I guess one, one typical um, a person I can think of is uh, uh, Dr. Karen Taylor, who's one of the people in the book that we describe, and she's a psychiatrist who works at a hospital here in Melbourne. And uh, Karen was an intern when she came to the retreat some nine years ago, having just been diagnosed. And she'd been told by her neurologist, really, that, look, um, I know you've just qualified in medicine, but you can never expect to work more than part-time and probably only in general practice because uh, you're going to be very disabled. And um, so the other day when she sent through her, um, her piece of paper from the College of Psychiatrists to say she'd finally specialised in psychiatry, she said, I think I might send it to that neurologist just so that he gets a sense of how much better I am. And she's completely symptom-free. In fact, she's now helping me run the retreat. So, uh, oh, wow. Uh, the, oh, wow. The pretty good stories out there. But the, but the interesting connection between the psychiatric part of this and the physical part is, is I mean, there's, there's something fascinating about that. And the fact that meditation is actually an important part of this. Yeah, it is, uh, it is really important, that connection. Uh, between mental health and MS. Um, people with MS have around a one in two chance of getting depressed during the course of the disease. And one of the things we found in, um, in our study is that the people who adhere to this lifestyle have a dramatically lower incidence of depression. Um, and depression, we know, actually worsens this disease physically. It's not just a mental issue. Isn't that something? Um, kind of changes your body chemistry in such a way that you're tipped towards inflammation and so you tend to have more relapses and have worse disability if you get depressed. So it's actually, it's a kind of vicious cycle and it's really important to break that and meditation is one of the really effective ways of breaking the cycle. You know, it, I mean, just, just kind of off the cuff thought that I had is, I mean, in thinking of all the many, many people that we all know, I'm sure we all have some people in that list of people that are always uh, hmm, the sad sack, you know, the person who's always complaining about this, that, or the other thing. And then every time you meet them, they always got something else going wrong, really going wrong physically. And you always say after you leave speaking to them, wow, this guy's cursed. I mean, every time you turn around, there's something wrong. And it almost sounds like what you're saying is that we bring that upon ourselves by, simply by being negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a, in a sense, there's some truth in that. I mean, we have to be really sort of careful in some ways about the language we use around our lives and around our health. Um, a lot of the things you sort of say about yourself and think about yourself end up being self-fulfilling prophecies. I mean, uh, you know, we mm. sometimes underestimate how important the mind is uh, day to day in, in the way we view the world and the way we view our health. And I believe it really has quite a significant impact on our health. And you had used that word stress, and people can get stressed out just through the uh, uh, weather changing. How can you, what, well, what kind of advice can you give people that they shouldn't let a stress overcome their common sense? Well, I think part of the, um, the benefit of meditation here, and we really recommend people um, have a think about 
approaching a, a tool like meditation with an open mind. I mean, it, it can be such a useful thing because it uh, diffuses a lot of that kind of anxiety that generally hovers around in our lives about relatively minor things. Um, learning to meditate can be a really useful way of overcoming a lot of those sort of petty annoyances in life and getting a much more even way of, uh, of getting through life and approaching life. It seems that children are pretty much um, optimistic, usually, usually vibrant. Mm -hmm. does, a, does a child with multiple sclerosis have to undergo the same types of things that, that you're describing in the book? Or maybe not, I probably phrased that wrong, but I mean, would, would those things be applicable to a child? They are, and I think one of the things that, um, as you're probably alluding to, um, that we know now is that MS is getting more and more common in younger people, so that we're now starting to see even very young children being diagnosed with the disease. It's, it's a disease which is rapidly um, increasing in incidence because of, really, the way we live in the West and the fact that we're mostly uh, eating unhealthy diets and so on. So That's, there are actually quite a few children out there with the disease now, and... Uh, it really is very helpful for them to adopt this this approach. I've uh, I've taught a 13 year old to meditate, a 12 year old to meditate. Uh, we've had quite young people on our retreats with their parents, um, and it it can make a really dramatic difference uh, to their disease process. And, and it is wor worth noting that you said in the West, which which would imply that our culture is partly to br blame. In fact, maybe mostly to blame. Mm -hmm. Look, I think that's right, and I think it's also true in respect of other common Western problems like obesity. Um, you know, in the, it, there's no point sort of blaming a person for being overweight. Um, when you look around at our culture, we're surrounded by calories, and mostly the calories are very empty calories. Um, yeah. Every outlet that you walk past is trying to sell you something that's got really not much goodness yeah. in it and a whole lot of calories. And so it's, uh, it's really difficult, even with all the willpower in the world to um, resist a lot of that for most people. So. Let me just ask you about the, about the omega-3 and, and the natural uh, ways of getting omega-3, which we would believe would be fish, I guess, mostly, and well, a flaxseed yeah. oil. Some, but with the, with the yeah. fish specifically, I mean, we hear so many reports of mercury being in the fish. Is it, is it almost like it, it's, you have one good thing and you're also adding something bad at the same time? Yeah, look, at this, there's a lot of... Uh, the truth in that, uh, and it is a problem with our oceans. I mean, we have sadly polluted um, our oceans to the point where um, a lot of the fish, particularly the big fish at the top of the food chain, where the mercury is concentrated, have become almost inedible. So if you are going to eat, be eating a lot of fish, you really need to concentrate on the very small oily fish at the bottom of the food chain that don't have much mercury accumulated, like sardines and herring and That's what they say, yeah. Uh, but the big fish like marlin and swordfish and so on, um, really they're so heavily contaminated now, particularly shark, that uh, it's really probably unsafe to eat those big fish. Um, but what we suggested um, through the OMS program is that you concentrate on the plant-based omega-3s. And as you said, Larry, um, flaxseed oil is a really good source of uh, those omega-3s, much more concentrated than fish oil. And in our study, the big holism study, we showed if you took flaxseed oil, you had 60% fewer relapses than people who didn't take flaxseed oil. Wow. So wow. It has a dramatic effect on relapses. If a woman is pregnant and then she is diagnosed as having MS while she's pregnant, is she able to have uh, a, uh, a normal delivery and her child be healthy? She most certainly is, yeah. And one of the things about uh, being pregnant with this disease is that pregnancy is somewhat protective for the mother. Um, but it's critical that, that a, a woman who does get pregnant who has MS thinks about reducing the risk for her child because, of course, there's that genetic component and the child is at much greater risk than the rest of the population. So for women in that situation, it's really important to keep their vitamin D levels high right through pregnancy. And often they're not told much about that because it's not widely known. But that can actually um, significantly protect the baby from ever getting MS itself. Wow. Uh, Professor George Jelinek, before we say goodbye, I want to make sure that I give away the two books that you sent us. If we have a listener out there that would like the two books, these are definitely going to be beneficial for you or somebody you love. Uh, one is called Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis, an Evidence-Based Guide to Recovery. The other one is the book with the uh, stories of uh, 
of people who've recovered from multiple sclerosis. That book is called Recovering from Multiple Sclerosis, Real Life Stories of Hope and Inspiration. I will give both books to the caller who asks for them. The rest of us have to go buy them. And uh, that's where I need some help, Professor. How do we, get, how do we buy these? Um, look, you can just get them on Amazon.com fairly easily, or you can go to uh, our website, overcomingms.org, overcomingms.org, and uh, there'll be some instructions there on, on how you can buy the books. But it's really available through uh, all good retailers. Okay, overcomingms.org is the website. Yeah, go to all of them. Uh, I'm sure anybody can get the books. Uh, remember, look up Professor George Jelinek, J-E-L-I-N-E-K. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for what you're doing. First of all, you're making a huge contribution to this world. And uh, thank you for taking time out of your, of your day to be on this radio show with us. Thank you, Larry. I really appreciate the opportunity. Really good stuff. All right, we will take a little break, and we'll be right back. What you may have missed on the John Tesh Radio Show. Strawberries versus blueberries. They're both health superstars. Blueberries have the edge, especially wild ones, have more antioxidant activity. That keeps your immune system strong. If you use a tanning bed for the first time before the age of 35, your risk of melanoma jumps 75%. Always use a credit card, not a debit card, on vacation. It has more fraud protection than credit card does. And check your statement when you get back, all right? Intelligence for your life on the John Tesh Radio Show. Don't miss this stuff. This is the Salvation Army, and I'm Major George Patterson to let you know that the Salvation Army is available 24 hours a day to provide help to anyone. We also have a family store at 120 Northwest 10th Street in Ocala. On Tuesday to Saturday from 9 to 4, you can do your shopping, or if you want to donate, you can call 352-732-4469, and we'll even pick up. 352-732-4469. All funds generated by our store go into the programs here in Marion County to help the needy. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. Fox News Radio, I'm Pat O'Neill. A day of family fun at the circus turned into horror in Providence, Rhode Island, when an aerial stunt support frame collapsed, injuring eight acrobats who fell and a dancer on the ground. You know, sometimes you're surprised, you, and it's part of the show, but this clearly wasn't. Authorities are following up. We're in the midst of uh, investigating the circumstances. Providence safety official Stephen Parrott, two of the nine hurt, are in critical condition. The Greek Coast Guard has found the bodies of 14 people, including two children, after two boats carrying immigrants sank. It's not clear where the immigrants are from, but Greece is a major entry point for people from poor or war-torn parts of Asia and Africa. They travel by sea, looking for a better life in the EU. Fox Radio's Emily Wither, the CEO of Target, is out. Out. Greg Steinhoffel has lost his job five months after a massive data breach at the retail giant. Fox News, we report, you decide. Right now at Napa, get your favorite flavor of Valvoline Conventional or Max Life Motor Oil for just $3.59 a quart. Buy five quarts and you'll also get a $7 mail-in rebate. Yep, seven bucks. Enough to get a plate of bacon with a side of bacon smothered in bacon. Mmm. Now that's tasty. Conquer the job with Napa know-how. General States pricing. Sales prices do not include applicable state, local taxes, or recycling fees. At participating Napa Auto Parts stores. Offer expires 531.14. Make your small business even smarter with ADT Security Services. Through June 1st, get $250 instant savings on select ADT business packages. Improve your operations with 24-7 burglary monitoring, remote climate and lighting control, secure real-time video, and more. So call Star Star ADT from your cell phone. That's Star Star 238. ADT. Our business is helping your business. 36 months monitoring contract required. For applicable terms and conditions, visit ADT.com. Florida, EF0001. Look who just walked in the room. Joel Wiesner from What's Up Ocala. Hey, Joel, I'm looking for something to do this weekend. You got any ideas? Absolutely. Check out our event calendar online at www.whatsupocala.com, and there is plenty of events there for you. Daily news updates to event reviews and magazine articles. Really? We've organized it all in one place online for you to cut through all of the hassle of finding something to do this weekend. We have a daily event calendar, a bi-monthly magazine, and we also do daily news articles. All right, Joel, that's perfect. Thanks so much. Yeah. Whatsupocala.com.
Uh oh. Is that what I thought it was? Um, as long as you don't think it was me running over a sprinkler head, then no, no, it wasn't. Oh, brother. Don't worry about it. I'll just add it to the honeydew list. If you had signed up for Mike Scott Plumbing's irrigation package in the first place, you wouldn't have to do anything. What? Mike Scott Plumbing does irrigation too? Um, yeah. I told you they have packages where they take care of everything. Yeah, but I broke it, so they're not going to cover that. Ah, but with their annual irrigation maintenance plans, you never have to pay for another service charge or broken sprinkler head ever again, regardless of the fault. So that means I break it, they fix it. That's what I said, Mr. Genius. Okay, okay, you win. How do I sign up? I thought you'd never ask. Call Mike Scott Plumbing today and ask about their irrigation maintenance plans. 237-2888. That's 237-2888. Mike Scott Plumbing. If water runs through it, we do it. Who would you feed if you had 50 chicken sandwiches from Chick-fil-A? WOCA and Chick-fil-A in the Paddock Mall have teamed up to reward one organization with 50 chicken sandwiches as a way of saying thanks for the great work that organization is doing in our community. And we need your help. See, there are so many great people doing great things that we need nominations. You can nominate your own organization or any organization you choose. Simply send an email to WOCA at WOCA. 